Greetings, everyone. My name is Hamid Dabashi. I teach at Columbia University in New York, and I am talking to you from New York. Uh, I would like to begin by thanking Rachel Cooper, who is the uh, uh, person in charge of culture as diplomacy in Asia society. Those of you who are not New Yorkers, you have to know that Asia society is a uh, institution that we greatly love and admire. Uh, and as a result, the screening of this absolutely extraordinary film, Coup 53, by Tari Amirani and Walter Murch at Asia Society is a major cultural and I might ask political event uh, that I would like to be uh, on the record to how grateful I am to be part of the conversation. But far more important than me are the two principal uh, people responsible for this film, Tari Amirani, uh, Iranian filmmaker, and Walter Merch, a distinguished and accomplished uh, editor and filmmaker and uh, a, celeb a celebratory figure in the industry uh, as a literally ingenious uh, uh, editor. And uh, it is not an exaggeration for me to suggest that uh, figures like Sergei uh, Eisenstein and Giga Vartov, these legendary figures in the history of cinema, all the way down to David Lane. Do you remember that famous shot of David Lane in uh, Lawrence of Arabia, the match, you know, blowing it, and then suddenly you are in the thing? We are in the presence of uh, absolutely. Uh, ingenious filmmaker, uh, and I have already told uh, Walter Merch how his way of editing has actually uh, influenced my writing. Uh, so we, without further ado, I would like to begin by uh, simply uh, asking Tari Amirani and Walter Merch to say a few words at the beginning, introducing their own films before we engage in a conversation. And I will map out the conversation shortly. We don't have that much time. We have 45 to 60 minutes. And I would like to give much of the time to the two distinguished filmmakers themselves to discuss, to discuss their films. So just uh, initial thought, uh, Tari, of how you began to convene, the, to conceive of this film. And more importantly, I think, is how did you convince Walter Merch to... Uh, to join you in this extraordinary project. Tari? Thank you so much for that introduction. And it's a pleasure to be talking to you. And again, thanks to Asia Society for hosting both the screening of the film and the Q&A. Um, as you know, with Iranians, Bisash to Mordad, the coup, is almost embedded in our psyche. You don't have to say anything to an Iranian except Bisash to Mordad, and that evokes all sorts of memories and ideas and thoughts and feelings which have been passed from generation to generation. And that applies to me, too. I first heard about Mossadegh's name uh, in whispers, in late night conversations when I was about seven years old. My parents and uncles would be speaking about the, the day's events and they would whisper this one word. And I never knew what, what it was as a seven year old. You don't know, but you just think, why are they whispering Mossadegh? I later grew up, found out more, studied, and uh, and found out the, the whole history. I remember when I was in Iran at school in Persian classes, they say they, they were history of oil. And they said, well, this is not BP, it's Benzina Pars. It's your oil. Don't worry about it. It's Benzina Pars, it's not BP. So I thought that kind of, all these things kind of churned in the back of my mind. I ended up being a TV documentary maker for about 20 years, making lots of films before I felt confident enough or, 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 or ready enough to tackle what is effectively the film of my life. This is probably the most important film I've ever made or will make. And what I didn't think was that it was going to get ten, take 10 years to make. I first had the idea in 2009. The other thing I never imagined in my wildest dreams that the gods of cinema were going to give me the greatest gift of cinema, which is Walter Murch. And the story of serendipity and how things lined up, and I, and I say gods of cinema made it happen, how we came to meet, uh, would, might, would surprise you, it came through physics. But Walter can tell it better than I can. Uh, l let me just add one word before we give the floor to Walter. You know, uh, I'm, you and I almost are the same generation. And the trauma of uh, 
uh, Kua 53, as you say, in we use the Persian calendar, Bistash the Mordad, uh, I have put it in writing, is the single most uh, traumatic historical uh, events of the 20th century uh, Iranians. Uh, I always say that we Iranians have a very long span of history. So the coup of 53 sits right to the Mongol invasion of the 13th century, the Arab invasion of the 7th century, and, and Alexander the Great's uh, conquest of Iran. So Alexander the Great, Arab invasion, uh, the Mongol invasion, and then the, the, the coup of 53. So uh, you're absolutely correct that this is uh, the historical trauma of our generation. Years ago, I was writing a book with the, uh, Peter Tcherkovsky, uh, and then we were co-authoring a book about iconography of the revolution. And at some point, Peter said, Hamid, I think we know that the Americans and the British did the coup of 53. You have said it about 15 times in the course of this book. Let's just stop to it because you know, it's like a knee-jerk reaction that, that we have. So, Walter, please. Yes, I was working, uh, editing another documentary in New York in 2012 uh, searching for the Higgs boson, the, the uh, effort at CERN in Geneva to uncover the last of the particles of particle physics. And uh, the gentleman who was partially financing that film was also an investor in Tuggy's film. And it turned out there was an event on the anniversary of the coup, as it just happened, at his apartment, and that's where I met Tagi. And Tagi graduated uh, from university as a, in physics, so <clears throat> we just started talking about physics. And he came to see this film. Uh, we were at that point where we were inviting people to come and look at the film, and he got very excited about it, and <clears throat> actually helped us over a. Uh, an obstacle, which was that festivals had kept turning the film down because it was too sciencey. So he pulled some contacts out of his uh, out of his wallet and uh, got us into the Sheffield Film Festival uh, in uh, where it won the audience award. So that led to us going on to Telluride, and the film became a. a <clears throat> and Tagi and I kept up our relationship, and he was raising money to make Coup 53 primarily from investors in Silicon Valley. And my wife and I live just north of San Francisco. And so he would stay at our house and we would he'd go down to uh, Silicon Valley and shake the can, come back with some pennies, much more than pennies. And uh, we would count them and go on our way. And I, I didn't think that I would ever get involved in the film. Uh, but it just happened that uh, the film that I was working on came to an end and I was at loose ends. And Tagi and my wife, Aggie, Tagi and Aggie, put their heads together and said, what Walter needs is a, a little short job in London. Um to for six months or so to finish off this this uh, documentary. Um, Tuggy had shot about 50 hours of material by that point. And so I thought, yes, absolutely. I, I love working on documentaries, especially unscripted documentaries where you don't really know where it's going to wind up. Of course, uh, as as they as Alfred Hitchcock said in fiction films, the director is God. In documentaries, God is the director. So six months turned into now six more than six years that we have been either making the film or trying to get the film distributed and fending off uh, potential people who wanted to sabotage the film because, you know, uh, it's a very complicated, wonderful story. But uh, here we are uh, almost seven years since I started working on this film. Uh, there are, uh, as you both know, Tari and Walter, uh, is there is a false, I would consider the false controversy that has been created around the year of uh, Norman Derbyshire uh, by the uh, 
people in charge of the movie, uh, of the documentary called The End of Empire. Uh, I want to get that out of the way uh, because far more important is actually uh, talking to Tari, telling us what is specific about his film, his uh, visual documentary uh, vision of the uh, of the film, and then to uh, to Walter about sort of what approach, what logic, what what rhetoric did he follow in in cutting it? The the false. Uh, controversy has to do with the fact that you use the documented, uh, uh, transcribed uh, evidence of an interview of a conversation with Norman Derbyshire. There is no controversy about that fact. And uh, yeah, there probably has been, a, uh, as uh, you argue, a, a video version of it, but we don't have access to that video version of it for whatever reason. One not... Uh, resort to uh, conspirator conspiratorial theories. You ask a uh, distinguished artist, uh, actor, uh, refines to enact that uh, that uh, document that you have not created it is all in the in the record. Uh, so the, what what amuses me, Tari, is that these British uh, producers have no idea. What it means if a, a group of British try to sabotage a film that has been made about the coup of 1953. They have simply no, uh, no consciousness of what it means. Uh, you know, literary works like the, uh, My Uncle Napoleon has been created in Persian exactly around the influence of the British in, uh, in Iranian history. It's not just uh, Iranian history. It's, yeah. Go to the streets of Cairo. There are streets named after Mossadegh by by uh, Yamal Abdel Nasser. Is uh, all over Latin America because of the, what the CIA did in Guatemala. It is not just Iranian. One should not pathologize Iranian have this obsession with the coup of fifty three. No, uh, if you go to India, it's the same uh, situation. Indian historians are now asking for reparation. Uh, of the, what the British uh, did in, in India. So yes, for us, Iranian, the coup of 53 is extremely important, but it is not just Iran, it's all over the, uh, uh, the, 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 the map. So I want to, uh, in my opinion, as I read in the literature, there is a sort of a false attention about to this controversy, as if the coup is controversial. The coup is not controversial, it happened. Uh, uh, 1954, a year after that, the CIA operative uh, wrote an internal mem memorandum, History of the Coup, uh, Wilbur. There is no controversy about that. I remember dur during uh, 1978, Kermit Roosevelt wrote an account of his role in, in uh, uh, the coup. Uh, the year 2000, when a copy of that thing was released, uh, New York Times wrote a long expose about what happened. Then the documents were released. Then my distinguished colleague, uh, Kinzer, wrote a monumental, wonderful book based on the thing. And then subsequently, perhaps the most distinguished historian of Iran, Ervan Abrahamian, wrote another uh, book on the, on the uh, event. So there is no country. President Obama in Cairo in 2009 apologized for it. Late Secretary of State, <laughs> Madam Albright, confessed and apologized. So it is important for the audience in Asia society to realize this false flag of a controversy, but the, is not about the coup. The coup happened from the President of the United States to the Secretary of State to distinguished historians, et cetera, et cetera. They have all documented. There is no controversy. It happened. Now, that brings me to the, to the essential question, uh, Tari, that I want to ask you. Of course, you know all of this history because of your own investigation of the, the project. What prompted you to, what madness prompted you to opt for a movie, for a documentary? Because if it's just, it's a historian like Stephen Kinzer or, or uh, Erman Abraham Yan, you just get hold of the documents, sit in the privacy of your home and start writing a book and get it uh, out of your way. But yeah. this running of a whole army of fundraising in, in the, you know, in California, this and that, what was it, if you could share with us, what was it that you thought it has to be in the form of a documentary or visual evidence that compelled you to go in that direction? 
Well, uh, the sheer power of movies as, as a storytelling, uh, as, a, as an emotional machine that connects with the audience, you can match that. Uh, I'm, I'm not a scholar or historian. I'm, I'm not a journalist. I couldn't do uh, all the Shah's men or Van Abrahamian's uh, books, but I can make films. Uh, uh, it was purely an instinctive feeling that there is more to this and I've got to dig deeper and I've got to do it for myself. The other reason was that it has to be a film that's made from a perspective of an Iranian who's also Anglo-Iranian, so he can see both sides of the bridge. Uh, it, it had to speak to more Iranians than have ever been spoken to, hearing authentic Iranian voices. I wanted to hear Persian spoken on the film by people who were still alive, who were involved directly or indirectly. So that authentic voice, both in the voice of the filmmaker and the interviewees was important. Uh, telling it in a compelling way that reaches beyond the borders of Iran. As you know, uh, we've just talked about this. Iranians know the story. You know, in fact, even Iranians who know, knew the story now think, wow, we found out new stuff because we have found new stuff. But the, impo the important thing was to tell people who know nothing about it. You know, for a lot of uh, Westerners, well, let's just take the Americans. For a, lot of Ameri for a lot of Americans, Iran starts in 79 and the hostage crisis. You know, that's, that's the ground zero. That, that, that's where the reference. And I, I wanted to say, hang on, wait, there is a backstory. In fact, why we are here is because we were there. And that story is important. And, you know, as evidence, uh, 80, 90 percent of audiences in uh, physical screenings when we could have in, in cinemas came up and said, I had no idea. I'm so sorry for what we did. So those elements were all part of why I wanted to make this film. And it had been bubbling in the back of my mind. I had to be mature enough. And, uh, and, and I realized, in fact, when I started, I didn't have the experience or the maturity or, or, the, or the wisdom to make it. I, 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 I made the film on the hoof as I learned. And I learned with Walter Murch. And that was, that was, the, that was the beauty of it. Um, and, and, and Walter has his own ideas of why it was important to tell the story the way we did. Uh, uh, regarding the sort of putting the history back from 79 to 53 is, of course, crucial. So we have a larger frame of reference. Uh, but at the same time, I always, when I do that, when I put the, the sort of a starting point to 53, I even go back to the Constitutional Revolution. When we have two extraordinary Americans who were devoted to the Constitutional Revolution, one was Morgan Schuster. Uh, who was a financier and who was in charge of the revolutionaries' bookkeeping. And he wrote a magnificent book, Strangling of Persia, against the Russian and British intervention in the course of the Constitutional Revolution. So this historicization is not anti-American. It is placing it history. The other extraordinary character is Howard Basker Baskerville, who gave his life. He was a Christian missionary in Tabriz, as you know, and he joined the revolutionaries and he gave his life. And if I were you, I would uh, uh, do your next film or Howard Baskerville. And from now on, make sure that Walter is on board with it. Absolutely extraordinary. He was a Che Guevara of the Constitution. Young, charismatic character who, was, who went there to uh, as a missionary, but turned out to become a, a revolutionary. So this sort of moving the frame of reference back from 79 to 53, it is in terms of, in, in interest of history. Walter, I want to go back, come back to you and ask you what in the substance of the event, in the substance of the coup interested you as a filmmaker, not by sort of serendipity that you and your wife sort of knew uh, Tari, when you saw the material, when you saw the, uh, the idea of it, if you could talk a little bit more sort of technically, how much rushes were, were done and how did you connect with it as, a, as an editor, as a filmmaker who saw there is a drama in there uh, and in, in what way was it different, say, from Apocalypse Now or from Conversation and from your other, all other wonderful work? What was it specific about this project that interested you? Yeah, I will talk about that in a second, but I just wanted to go back a few paragraphs and say that the, certainly the coup is not controversial, except for the fact that the British government to this day has not admitted that they were involved in it. And uh, there are 
uh, many instances where Tagi and I would go to briefings with the Foreign Service, uh, public events, and questions would be asked about the coup of 1953. And suddenly arms were crossed over chests and the words were spoken, we don't talk about that. Um, you know, neither confirm nor deny. So the testimony of Norman Derbyshire, who was a co-author of the coup with Donald Wilbur, uh, who was an MI6 agent, as Tagi said, he'd been in Iran since 1943 at the age of 19. He spoke uh, Farsi and um, knew Iran down at the street level. Uh, and then he was the man who was directing the coup for the British uh, from exile in Cyprus uh, through radio contact with the Rashidian brothers who were his main uh, enforcers on the, on the street. And at a certain point, um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, the CIA, after the first failed version of the coup, um, decided to call it off. They said, no, we have to settle with Mossadegh. He's got too much support. And it was Norman Derbyshire who, without consulting either MI6 or CIA, called out the mob on the streets and ordered the burning of newspapers and other things that re-inflamed the process. So his interview in which he admits all of these things and also admits to being involved in the kidnapping, torture and murder of the uh, General Afshartus, who was one of Mossadegh's main supporters. Um, we didn't know any of this in any kind of detail when we began the project. In fact, we, when we sketched out a storyline that might guide us through 532 hours of material, we also included a story card with the letter X on it, meaning the mystery that we hope we will uncover. And sure enough, after a, a, about a year and a bit, uh, Tagi uh, went to interview Mossadegh's grandson uh, in uh, in Paris, and Mossadegh, uh, this this gentleman um, had been an advisor on the End of Empire program, in which Norman Derbyshire had given a interview, which was later not included in the final uh, press. And uh, Tagi came back from Paris with a stack of papers, and hidden in this was this a transcript of this interview with margin notes by the filmmakers about how important it was. So that immediately uh, raised the... Uh, we began smelling a story here uh, that was dynamic, that, it, that the film was not simply going to be a historical recounting of the, as Tuggy said, the four days of the coup rather than the three days of the condor. Uh, that something had been hidden. Why was it hidden? Where is the material itself? And uh, it was following that particular trail as when you see the movie that you see how this story evolved. So uh, I, I had worked on Sam Mendes's Jarhead, which was about the first Gulf War in 1990. And so I, I doing research on that, I found out about Mossadegh. Um, I was 10 years old at the time of the coup in 1953. Uh, I was aware of politics as a 10 year old, uh, but I didn't know about what was going on in Iran and because it was still uh, pretty much a secret. But I was aware of the atomic bomb and the Russians and the McCarthy uh, stuff, all of which in some way enters into the structure of this of this film. And uh, as, as you can also see, it's it's very dynamic. I mentioned that Tuggy had shot perhaps 50 hours of material by 2015. And at the end, when we summed it all up, we had 10 times that amount, well over 500 hours. 
And so what you see in the film is a story that emerges as a rolling tsunami of events and on, and mysteries and dead ends and uh, live ends and uh, ultimately uh, led us to the point where not being able to find the audio or the video, the film of this Derbyshire interview, we decided to uh, get an actor to come in and read the lines because hearing of words is much better than reading them, as Tuggy mentioned. And then we thought, well, let's get a let's see if we can get a name actor to come in and photograph him as he reads the words, because an image is much better uh, than just the audio. And that led to uh, me thinking of Ray Fiennes because I'd worked with him on the English patient back in 1995 and 1996. And we had kept up correspondence over the years. And um, we managed to uh, uh, get an audience with him and show him some of the film. And he immediately got the idea of what we were asking and said, the only problem is scheduling it. How can we schedule it? Because he was playing Mark Anthony in uh, at the National Theater in Anthony and Cleopatra. Um, many twists and turns to that. But in the end, we photographed Norman Derbyshire or Ray Fiennes as Norman Derbyshire in the same room at the Savoy Hotel where many of the other interviews were conducted with the coup plotters on the on the British side uh, who were available to be interviewed in 1983, 30 years after the coup. So it uh, that's it in a, in a nutshell. Uh, my my guiding principle that we put up and Tagi can say it in Persian, but my guiding principle is dense clarity, clear density. <laughs> Try to be as clear as possible, but as solid as possible. And the image for that is a diamond, which is dense and clear um, with lots of facets to it that reflect light brilliantly. Um, and and the reverse of that, which is if you are dense, try to make it as clear as possible. And uh, so I'll turn it over to Tagi here to, to supply the missing words. I, I, I will turn to Tari in a minute, but I think, uh, Walter, in your uh, detailed response, I detect the, uh, the passion, the pivot, that kind of uh, focus your work, which is the figure of uh, Norman Derbyshire. The fact that you did not have access to actual visual interview has uh, given the film its signature excitement. Suddenly you have this world-renowned actor uh, coming yes. and doing this this piece uh, is a is a surprising, exciting, very cinematic moment that is both truthful and yet uh, 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 has a cinematic quality to it. Uh, so it I, I can't. And then I also saw in one of the videos that you kindly sent me when you do a, an analysis a perfect editor's analysis of the section on Stephen Mead, that what sections, yes. what sections were uh, taken out and what sections were included. Uh, Stephen Mead, as you say, the, the, tell the story, was a close friend of uh, Derbyshire. They collaborated with each other. They knew each other. And in an absolutely astonishing way, through your professional expertise as an editor, you reconstruct a relationship, a friendly relationship between uh, Mead and Derbyshire that implicates that there has been a, a, a consciousness and awareness, not off the record, not deep throat, as you call it, uh, referring to uh, 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 the American case, but a, a much closer relationship. So to me, what is exciting is how in the figure of Derbyshire, in the, in the technical analysis that you do with Tari in that wonderful moment that you're having the, the Steve Mead uh, interview in front of you, you have a cinematic insight into a political event, a political event that cannot yeah. be uh, mm -hmm. uh, denied. But it's not a question of denying that now we have 
now goes back, I, I give the floor to Tarina moment, that you really have an insightful, revelatory cinematic moment into a political uh, event. Yes. Tarina. <clears throat> Yeah. Um, yeah. I just uh, before before Taki answered, I <clears throat> just like to say Stephen Mead, who is the CIA counterpart to Norman Derbyshire, who was the man who Eisenhower sent over uh, in October of 1953 to help the Shah set up Savak, uh, he also does not appear in in End of Empire. End of Empire interviewed him, and it was the only interview he ever gave at any point in his life. Uh, and he was intimately involved with Norman Derbyshire. They're on a first name basis with each other, as you can see in the film. And yet neither of them appeared in End of Empire. And from a cinematic point of view, their relationship is catnip. Uh, and so the fact that End of Empire did not include either of those interviews, and for whatever reason they come up with to explain it, is uh, it doesn't pass for me the smell test of uh, of why such two important people were not included in the the program. Yeah, Thanks. Uh, there's there's just so much fantastic material here to, for me to think about. You you uh, um, you used earlier the phrase uh, false controversy. Uh, if you if if the British state has not admitted to its critical role, lead role in the coup to this day, to this hour and minute right now that we're talking here. Uh, if they haven't admitted to it, the Derbyshire interview, the testimony stands in for the most compelling British admission because he is the operative who wrote, masterminded and conducted and directed the, directed the coup. So Derbyshire is the, 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 you know, the golden crown of Coup 53's finding, even even uh, in their attacks on the film, and and I have to give credit to End of Empire in two ways. In order to distract from the film's main compelling revelation, the Derbyshire interview proves, you know, that says it from the horse's mouth, as it were, the British role in the absence of a British admission. So, uh, so they don't, they, even they don't deny that. In fact, in their press release, they go and say, all kudos to Coup 53. They're definitely the first documentary to bring Derbyshire's words to life. Hurrah for that. That is beyond a doubt. But they created a false controversy around this by shouting fire over there. So all kudos to them. In order to derail the attention on the film, maybe even deter distributors, they created a false fire and, and smoke alarm. Over there, over there, over there, over there taking away the attention of what the film is, what this film is revealing. They were very clumsy and really not together in the arguments they put forward for the, the false, false controversy they created. Yeah, 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 we, this is our interview. Yeah, these are his words. Yes, yes, yes. But it was deep throat. It was background. It was off the record. And we never filmed him. Now, uh, by doing that, they've actually dug a whole bunch of holes, which will be revealed in the follow-up that we're making, including the fantastic forensics with Stephen Mead and Derbyshire that you've referred to, that what you've seen in that uh, video of the Pacific Film Archives, that clip is not in the film, but will be in the follow-up, and it'll be also in the so-called DVD extras. So that will be shared with everyone. Um, I, I really don't know what they were on about, what they were really trying to do. They partly succeeded, but they partly failed in that the film is intact. In fact, by attacking our film, they drew the most extraordinary attention to the film. Werner Herzog, Oliver Stone, Michael Moore, uh, people who would never even give a glimpse or a second to this film came out fighting for it. Thank you, End of Empire, for putting our film on the map in the way you did, because, you know, we wouldn't have had that kind of attention. Uh, and so uh, there'll be more revelations about where they dug themselves into holes. Uh, the film, all the film does is get a multi-sided account. We talk to the End of Empire people, two of them. Uh, we, we talk to a journalist, uh, Nigel Hawks. We talk to Stephen Dorrell. We talk to the cameraman. We talk to Martin Daftari. They give different perspectives. We don't distort or stitch them up. We present those facts as they're given in those interviews. We let the audience to make up their minds. Never anywhere in the film, Walter and I say, Derbyshire was filmed, we can prove it, we can't, we weren't there, we don't have the footage, we can't do that. We have these people who say these things and then we, we present the interview itself. Um, in my uh, opinion, Tari, uh, we're kind of running time, so I, don't, I want to uh, get into another issue. Uh, as you rightly said, 
these people have done you great service and brought the film to a much wider and influential uh, audience. And, uh, as we say in Persian, your enemy will be a source of good for you if so God wishes. Uh, so I, w- I wouldn't worry. But, so, uh, but my recommendation is just you stop worrying about that. That is right now has assumed a reality unto itself. Yeah. Uh, if the British don't want to admit what they have done, you know, they are just being silly and obnoxious and nobody cares about the people who are silly and obnoxious. Uh, recently, I wrote a piece about uh, BBC was doing uh, a multi a series about fake news. I said, well, it's, but it's all about India fake news and uh, Africa fake news. I said, well, that's wonderful for us to know about fake news. But BBC itself was in the business of fake news when it was in, uh, integral to the uh, uh, coup of 53. But my question, I want to change it into a different direction. Yeah. Which is, which is uh, as you know, the coup of 53 coincided with the Bay of Pig, with the, the similar events in Guatemala. Soon after that, with the Suez uh, uh, Canal sort of in, invasion by the British and the French and the Israelis. Uh, my question is, do, do you have plans or uh, for show the, showing the film, say, in Latin America, people in Cuba and in Guatemala would be very much interested in what you have done or doing similarly, say, in the Arab world or so, doing similar way in India. So there are other comparative, comparative contexts where your film has larger resonances that you no longer really need to worry about some silly British government for their own bureaucratic reasons that they want to admit. Who cares? Uh, There have been so many uh, confirmations of this. The single, I wouldn't say, I I mean, I'm hesitant to say what I'm about to say. Your discovery of Norman Derbyshire is extremely important. Yes, of course. But it is not, the, I mean, there is a larger frame of reference in which he, he fits. So moving on. Uh, Walter, do you want to talk about, say, how would this film be seen in Latin America, in Guatemala, in Cuba, you know, in the larger, con- in, in Chile, in all the places that the U.S. has been involved in similar, if not identical, uh, acts of regime change? Uh, yes, absolutely. We are uh, still uh, we are pursuing getting distribution in these territories, finding the best path uh, to do that. We have been frustrated dis- despite the fact that the film got it, the film is the best reviewed film of any film I've ever worked on. It, it has a 100 percent rating on Rotten Tomatoes with 44 reviews, which puts it in a select group of only 109 other films in the history of cinema have received that kind of approbation critically. And yet no distributor will pick the film up. And so there's a there's another mystery there, which, uh, you know, has to do with why. Why is that? Uh, And so we're we're pursuing those those lines, but we so far have not had any success. Uh, we, we are talking to people about distribution in Latin America. There's a, there's a potential opening through Mexico. Uh, we had some connections uh, through uh, actually Walter's childhood friend, Ariel Dorfman, uh, into, into Chile. Uh, we've got plans, uh, even without official mainstream distribution, we have plans for self-distribution in India. I'll give you a little tiny anecdote. Uh, when the film was released in 2020, we, were, we had little social media clips tiny clips uh, from the film that were representing what the film could be about. And we we picked a bit about Churchill and and the angry Iranian oil company looting all the oil without giving any percentage of the profits to the Iranians. That was a minute and a half. And I I put that on Facebook uh, with targeted advertising into India only. And uh, within a day and a half, it had a million and a half views and the most incredible heated debate in the comment section. And I kept thinking, my God, if only the film was available right now in India, just imagine how many people will, will, will follow well, and watch. Well, we are, we are definitely uh, resonating with all the nations, and uh, there are many, I think 62 I counted, who've had coups and regime change courtesy of the CIA. Every one of those territories 
it is a very receptive audience for Ku53, and we are definitely working on that. And you're very right to highlight that very partic- particular interest beyond Derbyshire. Exactly. As you know, in the in this age of internet, and uh, I saw you have a wonderful website uh, that anybody around the globe can see it. You, you don't have to be in India or in Egypt or in Guatemala. People can have access to it. Nevertheless, I think there is a there is a point to be made about this film. Actually, with you and Walter, the two of you going uh, with the film and discussing it and, and engaging. In, in, in relation to that, now I have a specific question, Tari, for you. As you know, there, there are revisionist historians in Iran that are beginning to ask, oh, no, uh, it was not uh, uh, CIA, it was, uh, you know, some other Iranian mullah or this and that. Uh, are you going to produce a Persian version of this specifically for the, an Iranian audience? Well, there, we will really have a Persian version, fully subtitled. We spend a lot of time getting the, every, every word right. You know, the art of subtitling is very subtle. It's, as you know, it's not literal. You have to embody the spirit of what's being said. We have the most incredible Persian subtitles. The film has been available in Iran for over a year. It won the Crystal Seymour for Best Documentary at Fash Film Festival and the Audience Award at Cinema Verite. It's available to, and in fact, even before covid went crazy. It had a theatrical run in Iran. I used to get messages from people in Esfahan and Mashhad saying, I've just seen your amazing film. Thank you for making it. So Iranians have watched it, loved it. My inbox is full of uh, heartfelt messages from young Iranians who were born after the revolution. Right. You know, this, that's the that's the kind of their ex- extent of extent of historical knowledge. And they, they are constantly thanking Walter and me for telling our own story to us. Uh, we have Spanish subtitles, both Spanish and Latin American Spanish. We have French subtitles. So it's all ready. And we, we are planning. Uh, and I, this might be first exclusive here. We have huge, huge plans for the 70th anniversary of the coup uh, next year. Uh, well, so I want to come back and conclude with you. Uh, I think we're running out of time. And... Uh, Ask for your thoughts and reflections on the contemporary relevance, not just the historical. As you know, President Biden in Poland made a reference, oh, uh, Putin cannot stay in power. And then White House had, had to white, uh, walk that back that he didn't mean a regime change in Russia. But the history of regime change uh, in, uh, in in U.S. is not limited to, uh, to to Iran. What do you think today, 2022, in this particular post-Trumpian uh, period, uh, you know, considering the Asian society audience that will be first seeing this, uh, what are the implications? What are the what are your thoughts that you wish to share with that audience? Well, um, Harry Truman said. There is nothing new in the world except a history you do not know. And so uh, history has a kind of crazy habit of repeating itself. I mean, if you look at the U.S.-Iran relations for the last 43 years and even now, sanctions on oil, uh, fake news, uh, talks of regime change, uh, assassinating generals uh, uh, devoted to the regime. So uh, there are a lot of parallels that never seem to go away. Uh, I think... uh, For me, the the critical thing is for people who don't know the context of the toxic relationship to understand it better by watching the film. And and we know that works. We know when people say they have this kind of aha moment. Uh, As for other contemporary resonances, I I, I don't know. I mean, I've been distracted by other family stuff, so I haven't followed the Ukraine war and what Biden has been saying, but I'm glad that he backtracked on the whole regime change idea. Uh, but, you know, uh, my brother made a film about the Iraq war uh, uh, and, you know, the whole regime change in, in, in Iraq. We know how well that went. Uh, it, it seems to me we, don't, we never learn from history. Uh, Walter, I'm going to give the last words to you. Uh, simply about where would you play? You have such an illustrious uh, career as a filmmaker, where would you place your experience, your uh, affection, your attachment or your commitment to this film in the general, more general context of your career as, a, as an extraordinary filmmaker? Well, I, I think if you just look at the numbers, uh, I've, I've been 
involved uh, with KU-53 for six years, and I've been working in film for 50 years, so that's whatever the math of that is. Maybe a twelfth of my entire career has been dedicated to KU-53. I'm I'm nearing 79 years old. It's likely that I will not edit another film at this point. I'm writing a book right now, which is going to take me another year or so. So it's a capstone to a uh, career, uh, I would say. And uh, I'm very happy with that. It's, it's uh, if I if I have to go out uh, with Coup 53, that's per- perfectly fine with me. As a student and an admirer of your uh Wonderful work, Walter. What a fantastic capstone that would be to your uh, illustrious career and how lucky, uh, not just Tari as a filmmaker, but Iranians in general uh, have been that you took on this project. And as I implicated in the last part of my question, the larger world at the mercy of these colonial designs, when these people thought they can cut and paste whatever they want around the globe in India, in Asia, in Africa, in Latin America. And then finally, somebody uh, uh, with precision and investigative uh, work and cinematic panache, putting this and look signature on on this that nobody can deny. I mean, the the British government is just being silly and obnoxious and who who cares about silly and obnoxious people? Uh, I'd like to add one final thought. I mean, we've talked about this, how, what a gift it is. It is no exaggeration. And I'm I'm, I'm, to say that this film is Walter Murch's, like every frame beats with Walter Murch. I, I, I have never shied away from saying that this is the luckiest, luckiest break I had as a filmmaker. Imagine you're making the most important film of your life about the most pivotal moment in the history of your country as far as in your life, in your, in your uh, you know, imagination. And then you get Walter Murch to work on it. And uh, Walter is not just the editor of this film, he's the co-writer, quite rightly so, because he helped me make this film like no other editor on the planet could have. I could not imagine of any other person who would have made Coup 53 what it is. And that is, and and the other thing is that no matter what silly shenanigans the British come come up with in trying to derail this film and kill its truth because they cannot handle the truth, this film will last, this film will outlast me and everybody else and its truth will get out there in the best possible way. I have that, I'm sure. Uh, Simply as one viewer, who happens to be both an Iranian and a New Yorker. Walter is a New Yorker like me. Uh, I I want to uh, express my gratitude, my my admiration, my love, not just for the uh, truth that you have managed to tell so brilliantly, but for the artistry and for creating a work of art. The two of you, uh, both as the co-creators of this extraordinary uh, work for which I am grateful as one viewer among millions of others. Rachel tells me that she wants to come in and say a few words before we we conclude. I just want to thank all three of you. This has been a really insightful conversation. And I think it is so important the way you tell history, the way the story unfolds and that you've done that through, through cinema, through animation. Um, it really comes alive. And at a time where I feel that we are much more global in a, in a new way that we have yet to grapple with, this film is really important because it, it really, as you so rightly said, not only is very specific and about Iran, but it is really about a global phenomenon that we are all working to, to figure out in the you know, post-colonial hopefully post-colonial world, and one where we're asking those questions as well. So I just want to thank all of you. I want to tell everyone that we will be having So You Think You Know Iran, uh, our documentary film series that we are co-presenting with DocuNight and uh, that has been curated by Ahmad Kirastami, and that we are just grateful to you for, for kicking off this uh, film, what we feel is a very important film series. And to all three of you, thank you so much for being so generous in your time. Thank you, Rachel. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. My pleasure. 
Tari, lovely seeing you. Walter, delighted to uh, to make your acquaintance and uh, all the best. Thank you. Okay, for thank you. Q&A. That was fantastic. Okay, good night.